My name is Ron Carrico. I'm one of the docents at the San Diego Air and Space Museum and we're doing an oral history interview today with Don Morris, uh, a retired U.S. Navy captain, as I recall. Commander. And, commander, okay. Uh, right. And uh, let's just start with the easy questions here. Where were you born? Uh, born in Hollywood, California, 1930. And uh, what did your parents do at the time? My folks uh, were uh, from the state of Illinois. They had moved to California, and uh, my dad was a milk delivery guy. <laughs> and my mom was having trouble raising me and my brother. <laughs> so when the war started, you were about 10, 11 years old. 11, right. And now living in Hollywood, California, you must have seen a lot of aviation activity at the time. Yes. Uh, the, the, there was one other little side story that... My folks, uh, when I was 11, put me on a bus and sent me back to the uh, farm that they came from in Illinois uh, because of the fear of the Japanese bombing uh, California. And they had searchlights up every night, and my dad was a, uh, a watcher for airplanes. So it was a very uh, tricky situation back in, in that day, and nobody really understood what the Japanese were capable of doing. Well, the Japanese actually did launch some airplanes uh, off of submarines, as I recall. And they uh, did some uh, a very few uh, weapons off of submarines into the California coast. Right. They also did those firebombs, those balloons that landed up north yeah, someplace. That's, that's right, way up in northern California. Now, so what you went on active duty when? Uh, let's see, uh, about... I was uh, 22, so about 1952. So you had graduated from college then? Yeah, graduated, Cal went into the flight training program. Cal Poly. Right, good for you. Well, I went to Cal Poly too. <laughs> oh, I did not know that. Uh, yeah, I went to Cal Poly Pomona. Oh, well, no, that doesn't count. I'm sorry. <laughs> Four years, though. At Poly, yeah. Well, I only stayed there for two. I... I had uh, placed third in the nation in the high and low hurdles in community colleges at Mont Sac, and uh, they recruited me up, up to Cal Poly at that time. Oh, wow. So, oh, you, what, you ran in the Olympics? No, no, uh, in the junior college national championships. Okay, which junior college did you go to? Uh, Mount San Antonio College. <laughs> so did I. We held in the L.A. Coliseum. <laughs> I went to Mount Sac, too. Oh my God! You're kidding. I'm only like 11 years in back of you, though. So. Oh, I'll be darned. Huh. Now, active duty, you went into the reserves. Right. And you stayed in the reserves for ever. A total of 42 years. How 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 did you manage to stay that long? Uh, well, that's a, that's the total amount of time that I had. I I was the uh, 11th Naval District representative up here in Northern California for a long time. Uh, I taught the SEALs, uh, trainers of the SEALs. I went back to the Naval Academy and uh, helped them with their curriculum. Uh, my doctorate's in higher education, so it all sort of fit together. I, uh, okay. That good-looking guy in the back of you on our right is yourself. That's correct. Okay, and this, was, was, this was taken when? Uh, been, been about 1953. I was the, uh, I just done my carrier landings, the first landings, and um, we landed on the USS Monterey. It was a uh, aircraft carrier that was in a very big part of World War II, and uh, this was what they had accomplished in uh, World War II, what was on the, on the backdrop for us. Uh, I think it was finally um, put into um, harbor and finished, destroyed uh, by us uh, in about 1954-55. So those, all those flags represent ships that were sunk by the... Uh, by That's the correct, and bombs dropped and uh, submarines and, and ships sunk and the whole thing. So, the, uh, so you went to pilot training, I mean you, you got accepted for pilot training. Right. Went to, where did you go? Went through Pensacola, and uh, I got through it. Uh, it was pretty demanding, but um, it worked out fine. And I had my choice. I was getting going to get married at when I finished it to my sweet wife, who was still here with me. 
and uh, we it worked out very very well. So how how about airships? How did that happen? Okay, well I had my choice of uh, multi-engine, but it was in Alaska. Ooh. I had my choice of helicopter, but uh, that didn't seem to appeal to me at all. And uh, but the one that had a base that we, my wife and I, could stay our spend our honeymoon on was Lakehurst, New Jersey. So uh, I chose uh, airships, basically, just because that was the most convenient thing for me at that time. Now, Lakehurst, New Jersey, is kind of like the center of airship operations for the United States. It was at that time, yes. And it's also where the the Hindenburg went down in 1937. Well, good for you. You know all about it. Yeah, we did a lot of landings uh, over where the Hindenburg went down. Yeah, you're very knowledgeable. Yeah. Well, I, it was interesting. I, I, I'd never really heard about what happened to it. And uh, the guy did his own presentation. Or what he, They took some ad video. And apparently when it was making his last run towards the pylon, uh, it was sagging badly in the back, and they were dumping water out of the back of the thing to try and keep the the tail of it up. And so he theorized there was a leak of the of the hydrogen, which was something was leaking to let that bag sag like that. And then we know what happened after that. There was the explosion, and the whole thing blew up. Or right. Blew it up, we I did a say. lot of landings over where that went down, where it crashed. Uh, now, which when you were flying, so you go through. A primary, the basic, and you select to fly the airships. Right. Where, how many airships were there at that time, or do you have any idea? You mean nationwide, worldwide? Yeah, U.S. I really, I really don't. We had about, I think, uh, our hangar uh, took care of four, and we had two on the circle. I think we had about six airships at that time. At so, Lakehurst. Uh, now in now 1950, so you went, you became um, operational. What in 53 or so? Uh, you mean oh, when I started uh, actually flying yeah. the airships? And right. Stuff? Yeah, around 53, 54. And when you finally finished, how many hours did you have total in in them? Whoa, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, it must have been hundreds, but I don't really. Uh, that book is long gone, long lost. Yeah, well, they have. Fifty years later. I mean, I, I read somewhere where one of the airships flew down to Morocco and then back, and it was ended up with, what was it, 206 hours of flight time in the trip. <laughs> right. Well, the one that was impressive to us at the time, it had taken off from the East Coast and flown over to Europe and then uh, came back. Uh, and and landed. That was uh, they had to uh, refuel it a lot of times. It was that that at least that was the story we heard at that time. I think it was called Snowbird. I think that was okay. the name. Of God, again, you know stuff I don't have any idea. Yeah, well, there there is so much on. There is I just could not believe how much stuff there is. I mean, on the on Wikipedia, uh, there's 34 pages of information. I better read that. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. Well, the first the uh, first eighteen or nineteen have to do with the you know the Montgolfier brothers in seventeen eighty three and Dumont and all these other people you know flying these things around and and a lot of people were killed. It, were the, it seems to me that when it comes down to it, they're basically they're fairly dangerous. Yeah. Well, I think the Germans were the ones that really brought it to <coughs> as much perfection as they could possibly be. They were really big into the uh, airship world at that time, and, and of course the Hindenburg was a perfect example of them being able to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. And we had one airship called the America, which was uh, one of the big ones, but it was built by the Germans as war reparations. Oh, I, I'd say another guess. <laughs> you, you know more than I do. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, I, don't, I didn't know that. Uh, but at any rate, so... Explain the difference between a dirigible, a blimp, and an airship. Well, uh, my, the guy that's cleaning our yard is out there right now. I hope you can cut out the noise that... Uh, I don't that hear it. Playing. I don't hear him at all. Oh, okay, good. Uh, well, the only, really the only things I know about are the airship itself. 
the dirigible, I think, would be the German, uh, the massive bad, uh, German airships. And uh, ours were about the length of a football field. And as I remember, about oh, 10 stories high. How many crew? Uh, depended on the the uh, airship, we had several different kinds at that time. Probably we would run. Let's see, we had six bunks topside, so it must have been about eight to nine uh, crew members. So and now that and I noticed when they were mentioning, um, they were talking about the reading about the Macon. Remember the Macon went down off of uh, Point Sur up and uh, right, yeah, and it. Uh, and they referred to the title, they talked about the pilot, the pilots, uh, and then their Navy uh, uh, titles, and that, that's what we used, like first class, seaman first class, or, okay. is that what you mean, sergeant, or, I mean, not sergeant, um, chief, different kinds of chiefs and things, is that what you mean? Uh, did you watch that video that I sent you? No, I didn't see a video. Oh, I, I, I sent you a link to a video, and it, just to show you how this goes, uh, and the one I sent was a guy named Frank Murray, and Frank Murray flew, flew the A-12s, you know, the spy planes, the Mach 3 spy planes. Oh, yeah. I thought that'd be an interesting contest for you to watch. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll, it might be in my computer, and at 90, I just haven't figured out where to get it. I will look for it after we're done. It was one of the, the first, the first... Your ship was about 300 feet long, carried six to eight people, uh, and now you, when you were patrolling off the East Coast, that's what you, you were stationed at Lakers patrolling, correct? Right, for, uh, for Russian submarines. How f what was the furthest you ever went out? Oh, three or four hundred miles. So how long were the missions usually? Um, there, the, probably two or three days would be the longest uh, that might be a little too long, maybe maybe a day and a half. So in other words, you would have uh, extra crew members to sleep while the other guys were were working, I Outside, guess. Outside we had uh, four bunks that the crew could sleep on. Okay. Uh, now the one of the things I was reading that this might be something you'd be interested in, well actually they were mentioned during the war, World War II, they had six or seven airship bases on the East Coast, and they had three or four on the West Coast, including Moffett Field, uh, Santa Ana, uh, someplace up in Washington State. And I was surprised it didn't mention uh, Naval Station North Island because we have the huge blimp hangars over at North Naval Station North Island. I don't know why they didn't base out of here, too. Yeah, the big ones of bases were up in uh, next to San, San Francisco. That was where a lot of them flew out of. Did you ever fly cross country in a, in one of the airships? No, no, that wasn't. Uh, they weren't built for that that kind of world. So all all you were doing? Who would, who would have the uh, the uh, post to have them uh, land and and uh, stay on? No, it, it, it wouldn't be practical. One of the things I found really interesting, it said that during World War II, on the convoys, they had they lost 532 ships. They had 532 ships were sunk by the Germans in the convoys we had going back and forth across the ocean. But if they were protected by a, an airship, they only lost one. I've heard that. Yeah, that... Uh that was quite a, a benefit for the airship uh, at that time. So, what did you what did you carry on board your airships, as far as detection devices? Whoa! Uh, well, of course, we had radar. Um, we had uh, uh, we could tow uh, a uh, device that would tell us if there were submarines in the water. Um, that was the, the, what they called MAD, the detection device. Yeah, magnetic, magnetic anomaly detection. I believe it's said for. Okay, God, you really are. You you've done your research. <laughs> Good for you. So, what altitude were you flying when what you were? Altitude. Yeah. Oh, uh, probably uh, 
a hundred, two hundred yards. Uh, it was all oh, we never really went up too high because the blip, blip the the blimp itself couldn't take too much uh, change in uh, atmosphere. Now that's so we were always. Pardon me. Okay, now that's something I don't understand. One of the things I read was the term pressure height. What does that mean? Well, I think it back in that day it meant that if you got up too high, it started to collapse the balloon. The uh, the gas escaped from the balloon itself. Why? Uh, just because of the difference in the atmosphere. Oh, so there'd be so much pressure inside the... Okay. And now what is... The, there was another term I read. Was it Beldonet or Ballonet, something like that? It was uh, yeah. a, another bladder of some sort full of air. Right. Inside the airship itself, there was a two uh, bladders, I guess you'd call them. Right. And when, you're, when uh, the airship would lose some of the gas, the lifting gas then you would pump more air in to keep the shape of the, the blimp. You'd pump it into two uh, air containers inside the blimp. So that was just for the shape of the blimp? Yeah, well, that's what kept it in flying. Now, as far as the, the helium that you had on board, though, that could you replenish? Did you have tanks to replenish the helium in case you lost some? No. Really? No. That's why they were sort of limited to the coast itself. You couldn't go out too far. You had to keep coming back in to uh, to get keep your shape of the airship. If the airship lost its shape, it wouldn't fly. Oh, which is what happened to L three apparently. I guess because it sort of collapsed. I mean, there's a lot of pictures of it because it was it was flying over San Francisco and Daly City. Uh, you could see that it was just folded up in the middle. Yeah, that's and that was the danger. One of the dangers of the airship itself. So the all, all you did was just coast, just cruise around, and did you have? We were a, looking for Russian submarines. That was our main purpose at that point in time. Did you have a particular pattern of flying, like uh, doing uh, straight lines here and back and forth, or a grid type pattern, or? Yeah, yeah. If we uh, there, there was certain we had to do certain. Uh, flight patterns in order to uh, to function properly. I hope you. I hope that's what you're saying. Sure. Yeah. Well, when when we did, I was in search and rescue, and we had to fly certain kinds of patterns. Yeah, that's it. Creeping yeah. line search was one of them, and that sort of thing. Right. Right. But and then were they just flying one of the airships at a time, or do they have two or three airborne all the time? Uh, no. It, I'm I'm trying to remember all of this sixty years ago, but it was a. Uh, we, I think we had six airships all together at uh, Lakers, and uh, I think maybe two of them at a time would be up, or three. That would be about the max. So then you could cruise like the southern half of the United States, and the other airship would do the northern half sort of thing? Well, not the United States, but the ocean around the East Coast. Well, that's what I meant, yeah, off yeah, the coast. Yeah. Did you ever see one, ever find one? A uh, Russian sun, no. <laughs> We thought we had one one time, but they turned into the uh, wind, and we couldn't keep up. What? Really? Because the wind was blowing so hard, uh, the submarine had the speed. I don't know how they knew we were there, but uh, they had the speed to get out from under us. Probably heard you. <laughs> Maybe. I'm well, not sure how they figured it out. Well, a friend of mine flew... Uh, uh, S2s and, uh, you know, it's other, you know, propeller-driven airplanes. And he said that when they were trying to track anybody without knowing, they would go up to 25,000 feet. Otherwise, the submarines could hear them. Subject to what? The submarines could hear them unless they got up to... Oh, read yeah. Them. Oh, I see. Yeah, so... Yeah. Okay, so the controls you had inside for the pilot, I mean, you flew, you flew right side, left side, you know, uh, I'm sure you... Correct. So probably didn't make much difference. So how did you? Um, the, there's a con I've seen pictures. There's two control wheels. Right, Com did, uh, command pilot and uh, the second pilot. So would just one person fly at a time, or? Yeah. Did you have an autopilot? Yeah. So the so an altitude hold type autopilot, I presume. Yeah. Right. And then so was there? Did you have? I mean, looking at it back, I mean, there's a, these things have big rudders on them. 
Were there rudders on, on yours too? And did the did you have rudder pedals to move the rudders? Oh yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Now, when you turn one of these airships, do you turn it like an airplane, where it kind of rolls into a bank a little bit? And yeah. And what's what would they be the max angle of bank? Oh well, it wouldn't be very much. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but you 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 just weren't flying that fast to be talking banks and all of that kind of thing. What were you usually flying at? 35, 40 miles an hour? Uh, yeah, that would be a that would be pretty fast for the airship. And what uh, uh, were you using miles an hour or knots? Knots. Knots. Yeah. Thank God. <laughs> well, World War II airplanes they used uh, miles per hour, you know. So. Yeah. So when you did want to turn, and I presume when you're on a long mission, you're probably what turning every twenty or thirty minutes. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, maybe I don't understand the thought. Well, I, well, in other words, you'd fly straight and level for quite a bit of time, and then roll into a left or right bank and. Yeah. To turn the thing, right? Yeah, there weren't very much rolling of banks, but yeah, that's we'd turn it and it would, the airship itself would turn. And go on that speed and make a pretty sharp turn, I'm sure, if you needed uh, to. Yeah, you could make a sharp turn, but I don't want to pretend that, that uh, like in a regular airplane, that you you had a big turn. It was, it took a while to turn, it was an effort. Yeah. You said when I talked to you a couple of days ago, one of the problems was coming out of a hangar. That if you're inside, yeah. a, why is that difficult? Well, if there was a crosswind of heavy enough, you couldn't get it out of the hangar. It'd take it'd take maybe thirty men on the lines to uh, hold it steady as you brought it out of that hangar. Right. Okay. And uh, if the wind were blowing, the thirty men couldn't hold the the bag itself. It was just too big. Now you had. Uh, uh, Curtis Wright engines, I think, 1,800 cubic inch engines, I think, two, I believe, uh, one on each side, I presume. And were the engines inboard or were they out on the cells? Outboard. Yeah, that, it was, uh, I, I hope I understand your terminology, but they were outside the uh, car quite a bit. It must have been noisy as hell inside that airship. Uh, not, no, not necessarily. Uh, the, the engines were outside on on um, sort of, I'm not sure how to phrase it, but they were away from the uh, the car itself. And you could actually change the pitch too, right? From straight down? Yeah. 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 And that was part of the landing and takeoff procedure, wasn't it? Yes. So Good. this, this tell me, a, okay, just close your eyes for a second and just imagine yourself rolling down the runway. How do you, what do you do? How do you make it get airborne? How do you make it? How do you, airborne, is how what do you, you said. Yeah, how do you take off? Yeah, you just add power to the engines and uh, pull back on the, uh, um, I, don't, I don't want to say uh, the wheel, and uh, eventually uh, at certain knots, the wind would pick up and around the bag and help you uh, take off. So when it's sitting on the ground, I mean, I always see pictures of guys you know holding the thing down. So oh, yeah. if you if it weren't holding it down, would it just float off into the air then? Or yeah, uh, the little side story. Uh, I had the duty uh, at the and we had an airship coming in and landing, and they uh, had uh, trouble uh, in flight, and uh, we needed a lot. They couldn't uh, turn the engines down. And so we needed a big crew uh, to uh, go out and handle the lines as the airship landed so we could put it on the mast. And uh, it came in, and we had about 50, 60 men out ready to grab the lines and uh, to help slow it down so we could get it on the mast. And uh, it was a, a, and the radio had been shut off of the, uh, in the airship itself. So it was a pretty nasty situation, and we noticed that uh, the commanding officers of the different units on the base had showed up to try and help, and they looked around and realized that they were the senior officer present at this potential serious accident, and they started disappearing, and when it all ended up, there was a lieutenant and myself as the commanding officers to try and land this airship. 
and uh, we got it down on the ground. And but it, we had about a hundred men out to grab the lines to pull them, pull them back to help slow the airship down, so we could get it on the mast. I'm not sure I'm telling this story, so everybody understands. But finally, we did get it on the mast, and uh, the crew uh, bailed out. It was a pretty situ nasty situation. I think what triggered the whole thing was uh, one of the gas tanks on the airship had started to uh, leak, and they had uh, uh, notified us and then shut off everything but the motors themselves, the out, out motors, so the gasoline wouldn't explode in the car. That's a little complicated. I'm sorry. I, no, I get, I, I get it. But then, so then they had to drain the. They probably foamed the whole thing first, didn't they? And then drained the, drained the gas out? Once, once they got it on the ground, the crew bailed out real quick, and the fire crews came up and uh, filled the cars with, uh, with foam. Did, now, when, you have, when you're flying the, the airship, did you, what did you wear? Uh, did you have a, wear a, 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 what do you call it, a, a life vest on it? When you're yeah, just a regular flight suit. Okay, and did you have parachutes? The same, the same one you would wear, uh, we wore when we flew our airplanes. Uh, you had to keep your flight time up uh, in uh, regular aircraft to get paid for flight time. Right. So uh, we would we had continued to fly uh, P2Vs and F SNJs out of the out of the base in order to keep your flight time. Which reminds me of that funny story you told the other day about the uh, the captain that would come down to get his flight time on the airship. Oh, yeah. I think you should tell that story. That's a good one. Well, okay. Uh, so uh, the uh, this, this captain uh, would fly up out of Washington to get his flight time in the airship, and it was easy to do it. And he had somebody in, uh, I think it was an SN, no. Well, it's, it was a... He had somebody fly him up to the to the base, and then he would uh, uh, get on the airship and fly out uh, for oh, five or six hour flight or ten hours, spend the night maybe aboard, sleep, and uh, then he would come back and land, and he uh, would get off the airship and he would have his flight time, and uh, that worked out really well for him, and we were glad to see him. It didn't matter whether he was on board or not. I wasn't aboard this flight, but they were trying to pick up water to balance for the gas that was being expended, and they have a big uh, uh, lifting device to bring water in and take the place of the gasoline for weight, and they got too close, and it uh, touched into the ocean, and the com commanding officer uh, pushed the button, ooga, ooga, ooga you know, danger, uh, we're, we're in a bad situation, take your places. And the captain had been up topside sleeping, and he heard the hooga hooga, and he hopped off of the bunk and ran down the uh, flight of steps to the first deck, and then he saw the water coming into the uh, airship itself, and so he pulled, he had his uh, life vest on, and he pulled his, his uh, life vest on both sides and jumped into the ocean. And his weight was enough to release the the airship's uh, sort of suction on the ocean, and they went up, and they got everything started up again. But he's down in the ocean at the Atlantic, pretty far out, and uh, and it went uh, a notice went out uh, from the captain that the from the captain of the airship that the uh, captain was in the water. And uh, they diverted ships from all over the west coast, uh, east coast, to help him. And uh, it was sort of a, it was embarrassing anyway to uh, to have him do that. And the airship flew fine and it got back to the base, but he was left out in the ocean. They couldn't pick him up. <laughs> Is that the most hazardous thing about flying an airship? Well, if you went down in your airship. Uh, if your airship went down, there was really hardly any anything to uh, to save you except your, if your if your radio was out. Um, but basically, the airship itself was a very safe uh, uh, device. Probably the enlisted men that handled the 
ropes that help put it on the uh, on the mast uh, were probably in as much danger as anybody because several of them were injured trying to help control the airship itself. So joining up to the mast, though, when you're coming back from your mission, uh, I, I suppose you had VOR and all these other kind of instruments to find the base in the first place. Yeah. But then when you got to the mast, then how did you know how to approach it? What speed did you use? And how did you actually well, how did you actually do it? What was the procedure? Uh, there was an officer on the ground that controlled both the uh, the, air, the uh, mast itself and the pilot. He would give uh, motions to the pilot. <clears throat> there was a man on top of the mast that would hook the uh, nose cone to the mast itself, and then they had an engine at the bottom of the mast that would pull it up and lock it into the mast itself. Oh, wow. I'm not sure I'm making that clear. No, that's it. They had men on each line. And, and they had men uh, on the uh, on the mast itself to, to make it all happen. How, then how far was the car above the ground? Was it just a short ladder to get down to the ground then? Or? Well, it was about, there was, a, there was a couple of, there was a wheel on the ground and it was about, you had to climb a ladder, so I'd say about six, uh, six feet to the bottom of the, uh, uh, of the car itself. And did the... Now, on board the on board the uh, airship, you had a kitchen, right? Yes, right. And a bathroom. Oh yeah, definitely. Gotta have that. They out for long, long runs. Oh yeah, right. Do you, can you remember the longest time you ever spent in one? Huh. No. Um, we went down to Florida one time. That was a long, long, long flight. There was a base down there that took care of airships as well. Um, and there were a lot of winds that were blowing that were um, taking us off the course and buffeting us trying to go into the winds. The winds were a big, big factor in airships. I mean, they were huge, you know, six, seven stories high and the length of a football field. So any any weather deterrent would, would be a big deal about... Uh, getting your airship flying. And well, your, your top airspeed was what, about 70 knots or something like that? I've never been to 70 knots, but uh, I, I think we were usually around 40, 50. Oh, wow. So if you got a 40, at 50. Most, at the most. Yeah, okay. I, I just remember, you know, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a docent at the Air Museum, so we have a lot a lot of discussion about World War One and things. And, and the subject always comes out about the dirigibles uh, that the Germans were using. And I thought, well, you know, they had a real problem because the wind blows west to east, and so if you're going to fly from Germany to England, if you've got too much of a headwind, you ain't going. <laughs> right. You're not going to make it. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of a lot of stories about uh, the the airships bombing the hell out of uh, of London. Uh, the the Germans really, uh, and then 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 the uh, command pilot, the German pilot, would. Air, uh, airplanes coming up, so he would try and get away, but a lot of times they were very, very vulnerable. They had no speed compared to the air, airplanes themselves. It was a, it was, but they could carry a hell of a load of bombs to drop on London. Well, and they also had, uh, they were also helium. You know, yeah, or, yeah, that was, or yeah, yeah, hydrogen, that was, I mean. Right, yeah, that's, that was a big, big, big problem. One of the things I read was that the Hindenburg had a um, stable mate, I mean exactly the same ship, I can't remember the name, uh, and it was down in South South America somewhere when the Hindenburg you know, crashed and blew up, or blew up and crashed, <clears throat> and it said it was the same, same exact, well what they did is they flew it back to Germany, and then they tried to fly it with hydrogen, which was pretty hard to get a hold of, but it didn't. It wouldn't provide enough lift, and so they canceled. They never flew it again. Huh. no, I had no knowledge of that. That's interesting. Do you know? Do you know much about the uh, uh, the Macon? Not not much. No, yeah. except that it was a, a lesson learned for all of us about trying to free balloon the uh, the remains of an airship and save the crew. Yeah, I think they only lost two people out of, out of it. 
I'm getting a big reflection on my screen here. I don't know why. Oh, well, maybe I'm doing There is an Airship Association, and they're, uh, they've got quite a few stories on their uh, website, too. Yeah. Well, tell me the story about, okay, you're in training, and you had a lieutenant, and you were supposed to uh, do some free ballooning because of the situation where that could happen. And you right. told the story about what happened, about what a character he was. Well, uh, this was this was uh, when we were going through training. I was trying to think of the name of the base that we were on. It was not at Lakehurst. It was before that. You had to go through a pretty severe training program to become an airship pilot. And uh, part of the training was to uh, free balloon. And so we, I think there were four of us in the bag, in the uh, little container that, and the airship, and the uh, bag was over our heads, and the enlisted men were holding us down, and we we're getting ready to go, and we were just going to uh, experience um, the uh, uh, free ballooning and see how it how it worked, and and that's sort of what what airships were doing. So uh, the enlisted men were holding the bag down and. The um, uh, it let it go and we went out and we drifted along and then the lieutenant drops us down into the treetops near uh, Glencoe, Georgia and uh, the tree trees are banging us around and he says uh, uh, this is uh, this would be good training for you but we're really shaking in the in the basket and then all of a sudden we're moving through the trees probably about 15 20 miles per hour and uh, all of a sudden, a house in the middle of this forest area looms up, and he says, throw the bags over. So we're throwing sand bags over out of the uh, out of the basket, and we just skim the top of the house. But the rope that we've been dragging through the tops of the trees to uh, sort of get a feel for how rough it could be uh, wraps around the chimney of the house and explodes it, and we keep going. And there's a, there were a couple of people in the yard that were very concerned to see us just emerge out of the uh, Georgia forest. And uh, anyway, uh, we never heard anything more about it. But I think we were pretty, I think that lieutenant was a little crazy. <laughs> That's about it. He was probably survived World War II. Huh?